A Valediction Forbidding Mourning by John Donne Summary, Analysis and Explanation Hello and welcome to the discourse. A Valediction Forbidding Mourning is one of the finest love poems of the Elizabethan and Jacobian eras that was written in 1611 or 1612 by John Donne. The poem was published posthumously in 1633 in Donne's collection Songs and Sonnets. John Donne was bound to a trip to continental Europe and before leaving his beloved pregnant wife Anne alone, he wrote this poem. The poem has 36 lines composed in 9 stanzas. Thus, each stanza has 4 lines. Unlike other poems by John Donne, which often have a strange rhyming scheme, a valediction rather has a simple form with a consistent rhyming scheme ABAB in all stanzas. All the lines of the nine stanzas are in iambic tetrameter. Themes of a valediction Just like in many of his other poems, Dunn explains his philosophy of love, death and spirituality while using some surprising conceits. The poem can be considered as an example of carpe diem poetry. A carpe diem poem suggests or promotes a particular way of living while reminding the reader that death is continuously lurking behind. The poem begins with a description of a group of friends standing around the deathbed of a virtuous man. They discuss imminent death while the poet turns their feeling into enthusiasm towards life. He then suggests the importance of love and how his love for his beloved is spiritual in nature. A Valediction is a metaphysical poem and then offers some surprising metaphors, conceit and imagery in this poem. The very prominent imagery is that of troublesome, disastrous weather patterns. Dunn uses these weather patterns to describe the love of a different couple and then he suggests why his love for his beloved is of higher spiritual value. The most important conceit offered by Dunn in this poem is that of a compass. Dunn compares his relationship with his wife Annie to the compass. Dunn describes the compass as stiff with a fixed foot that doesn't waver around. It is his wife's part. The other part of the compass is the poet himself that continues to roam around. The steadfastness of his wife always brings him back to her. The compass represents the balance between the couple. However, the most bizarre yet meaningful conceit is the comparison between the calm and peaceful death of a virtuous person and the mature spiritual love of a loyal couple. Summary as virtuous men pass mildly away and whisper to their souls to go, while some of their sad friends do say, the breath goes now and some says no. The poet begins with an image of death. A virtuous man is on his deathbed. He led a virtuous and honorable life and now he is about to die peacefully. Dunn expresses death here as whispering tones soul away. Dunn uses anomatopoeia or whisper here. The man is surrounded by his well-wishers and friends. Whisper is an example of anomatopoeia. His death is so calm that his friends are unable to decide whether he passed away or not. They ask each other if the breath is going on or not. The man led a satisfactory life and even at his death there is no need for mourning, desperation and dissatisfaction. So let us melt and make no noise. No tear floods nor sighs tempests move. Twere profanation of our joys. To tell the lady our love. The reader may wonder why the poet depicted a death scene in the first stanza. In the second stanza, he offers his insight. He specifically wrote this poem for his wife before going away on a sea voyage, leaving her alone. The poet compares the peaceful death of a virtuous man to the love between him and his wife. He suggests to his wife that though they are going to separate for a while, their separation shouldn't come accompany tear floods and sigh tempests. The poet belittles other couples who show their passion in open. He suggests that his relationship with his lover is way better and respectable. It will be profanity to show their joys of meeting and sadness before he departs away to laity or common people. So the poet is saying that though unfortunately he is forced to go away while leaving his wife alone, their relationship is so mature, strong and superior to relationships of others who fail to control their passion 
that they will bear this troublesome time with complete calm. The poet says that their farewell should be as mild as the uncomplaining deaths of virtuous men. Moving of the earth brings harms and fears. Man reckon what it did and mean. But trepidations of the spheres through greater far is innocent. The poet further suggests that his relationship with his wife is superior to the relationships between other couples. He says that the separation of a common couple is like an earthquake that brings a lot of harm, fears and suspicion. However, he is also going away from his wife, but they are no common couple. They are superior. Unlike the earthly people, their love is celestial. Just like the earth, other celestial bodies like the spherical sun or moon also go through trepidations, but they cause no harm, no fear. His relationship is not like a showy earthquake, but it is more genuine and powerful like the movement of celestial spheres. Also, the poet suggests that his going away is no big deal and there is no need to cry and complain as if some disastrous earthquake has occurred. Dull sublunary lover's love, whose soul is sense, cannot admit, absence because it doth remove those things which alimented it. The poet continues to belittle other couples, describing their lesser love as dull and sublunary. Their love is not brightly shining like the moon, but it exists under the moon, or the brightness of the moon, celestial sphere, hides their love. The poet already compared his and his wife's love as a celestial sphere. He further explains that the love of others is dependent on senses. The soul of their relationship is based on senses like to touch and see. Their love is a carnal affair. In such cases, when the two lovers move away or get separated, the poet explains that the love also evaporates. Absence or separation removes the love between such couples as in absence or separation they cannot see or touch each other. But we, by a love so much refined that ourselves know not what it is, enter assured of the mind, care less eyes, lips and hands to miss. The poet dedicates the fifth stanza to explain the spiritual platonic nature of his and his wife's relationship. The poet says that his and his wife's relationship is so much refined and pure that they themselves are unable to grasp it, its spirituality. Their love has got mysterious qualities. Their love is not completely carnal and it is much less dependent on eyes, lips and hands. Thus, even in separation, these senses of touch and vision won't be missed as the two lovers are bound mentally, spiritually and despite being separated separated physically, they won't feel any separation as on mental and spiritual levels they will remain close as one. Our two souls therefore, which are one, though I must go and you are not yet, a breach but an expansion, like gold to airy thinness beat. In the sixth stanza, the poet strengthens his idea about the spiritual relationship between himself and his wife. Dunn employs a simile and compares his love relationship to gold, the purest malleable metal. He declares the nature of his relationship that has made the two souls of his and his wife as one. The oneness allows them to bear the physical separation. The poet suggests that his going away is not a breach of their relationship, rather it is just an expansion. They may physically remain apart, still their soul is one. The poet explains this expansion by using the example of gold, which stretches when it is beaten. If they be two, they are two, so, as stiff twin compasses are two. The soul, the fixed foot, makes no show, to move but doth if the other do. In the seventh stanza, Dunn says that even if it is not so, even if their souls are not combined, they are not one, then also, their relationship has tied their two souls in the manner of a stiff compass in which there are two parts. One is his wife, which remains fixed-footed and doesn't wander. The other part is the poet himself, who continues to wander and move away, yet is tied to the fixed foot. His wife is the steady soul that remains grounded and doesn't show. 
Like the fixed leg of a compass, it never moves independently but shows balanced movement when the other leg moves. Dunn used the exaggerated simile here. He presented his relationship with his wife as a stiff twin compass with two legs. And though it is in the center seat, yet when the other part doth room, it leans and hearkens after it and grows erect as that comes home. Dunn continues the conceit in the eighth, eighth stanza and explains how his wife leans like a string when he wanders away and succeeds in bringing him back. It is like the fixed leg of a compass that doesn't move by itself, but when the other leg moves away under the magnetic effect, the fixed leg bound to the wandering leg bends and leans towards the other leg. This stretched bond hearkens off or pulls back the wandering leg at its place. Similarly, Dunn's wife leans towards him when he is away and pulls him back home. Once the fixed leg gains its original position, it again becomes stiff and erect. Such wilt thou be to me, who must, like the other foot, obliquely run. Thy firmness makes my circle just and makes me end where I begun. Dunn continues the explanation of his conceit in the ninth stanza and concludes the poem. He explains how the fixed leg of a compass keeps the wandering leg intact while allowing it to move in just balanced circles. In the same manner, the firmness and loyalty of his wife make his trips and tour just. And just like the wandering leg of a compass, he also always comes back to his home from where he began. The poet declares that no matter where he goes and what he does, the firmness of his wife will always bring him back to his home. Dunn wrote this poem to his wife to make her strong enough to bear the separation. First he explained why, why mourning or complaining about his going away is useless. He raised the spiritual love between his wife and him and explained how they are two bodies but one soul and thus physically they may separate. On a spiritual level, they are one. The firmness of his wife's character is what brings the poet back to his home whenever he goes away. So this is it for today. We will continue to discuss a few more poems by John Donne, including his religious works, and then we will move towards other metaphysical poets of the same era. Please stay connected with the discourse. Thanks and regards.